Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to HK45 webinar on exploring technology disputes in Asia Pacific region. My name is Gökçe. I'm a consul at HKAC's arbitration team, and I'm very much looking forward to moderating this webinar. Today, we have experts from different jurisdictions who will share their views and experience on different types of technology disputes. They are not only from different jurisdictions, and I must say they also hold different roles in international arbitration. I would like to introduce them now, and then we will start the discussion. We will then have a short Q&A session after the discussion, so please make sure to submit your questions to, through the Q&A function. Uh, Bernard Ten is the Chief Counsel at Integrated Regulatory Office at SAP, which provides enterprise cloud services and application software to customers from more than 180 countries. He is also a General Secretary of Association of Corporate Counsel. He co-leads a global cross-department program designed to make regulatory compliance of SAP cloud products scalable and sustainable. Bernard also acted as Chief Counsel Cybersecurity as SAP and co-led SAP's cybersecurity legal function. Prior to his long career, in his company, he was the Asia Pacific Region General Counsel and Commercial Director for a fintech company. He holds an LLM degree from Stanford and LLB and MSc degrees from National University of Singapore. David Kreider is an independent chartered arbitrator with offices in Hong Kong and New Zealand. He has specialized in te deciding te uh, technology, media, and telecommunications, intellectual property, dis distributed ledger technology, mergers and acquisitions, internet domain, na domain name, and hospitality and financial services disputes since 2006. He has been appointed as arbitrator in more than 40 international arbitrations administered by various institutions, including ICC, HKAC, SIAC, and ICDR, as well as ad hoc proceedings. He also acted as a panelist and expert in more than 200 internet domain name disputes. Last but not least, he acted as a general counsel to telecommunication providers, China Mobile Hong Kong, and Vodafone New Zealand. Hun Yang Ku is a partner at Lee and Co. Seoul, uh, but she's currently uh, doing a second one at Herbert Smith Freehills in Hong Kong. So welcome Hun Yang to Hong Kong. Her main area of practice includes international arbitration cases at leading arbitral institutions such as ICC, LCIA, KCAB, CAS, as well as ad hoc arbitrations and cross-border litigations. She handles a broad range of matters involving construction, software license agreements, military projects, international sports-related disputes. Prior to joining Lee & Co, she worked at Samsung's CNT legal team, where she handled legal affairs regarding various offshore construction contracts in Australia, North America, South East Asia and Middle East. She is currently in secondment at Herbert Smith Ferry Hills in Hong Kong, as I previously mentioned. Jennifer Wu is a senior disputes lawyer at Pinson Masons, specializing in commercial and technology disputes and international arbitration. She has a particular focus on cross-border cyber technology and data governance related issues, protecting systems, software and information held online for businesses. Jennifer has been commended for her handling of disputes in complex projects and cross-border matters in various regions, such as Europe, England, China, Singapore, Korea, and India. She is one of the thought leaders for the global technology digital market space and has been praised for her straightforward and practical advice. Um, Jennifer also writes about various topics on technology disputes, and she recently co-authored a publication on cryptocurrency disputes, one of the on-demand topics that we frequently hear these days. So let's start with this topic and with you, Jennifer. Uh, could you please tell us from your practice or observations in Hong Kong, what are the key features of a cryptocurrency-related disputes? And are there any special circumstances that the arbitration practitioners should consider when dealing with these disputes. Thank you, Gotcha, for the kind introduction. So firstly, I wanted to cover obviously the common type of crypto disputes that we're seeing in, in the region, not just Hong Kong. Most of the times they will be claims of a contractual nature by investors or users against the crypto exchange platform, um, normally arising out of a lack of access to the trading platform or some payment 
you know, or failure to make payment um, or failure to kind of execute a transaction at the time that, you know, they were meant to do. There could also be misrepresentation type of claims by investors against platforms um, concerning kind of the well misrepresented <laughs> risks of investment and um, where we're also kind of seeing the trend is obviously claims relating to the enforcement um, of um, arbitral awards at the local courts as well you know to do with kind of crypto related um, claims especially when the crypto is either missing or has been stolen. So points that arbitration practitioners should consider uh, there are four main points that I really wanted to mention um, so the first one is you know new areas of law could arise. Um, there's always novel legal issues when it comes to kind of crypto and issues relating to the blockchain. So some issues that can be considered is, you know, what law applies to a blockchain transaction in the absence of a governing law clause, for example. Currently, crypto is a form of property in the legal sense, but would this change in the future? And also whether a binding dispute resolution clause can be actually embedded into a smart contract. Also, legal issues to consider is service via blockchain, for example. Can this be done? Um, I think when dealing with crypto claims, because of you know how crypto is, is, it's always good to kind of figure out does the current legal framework work, and if not, then think of actually how how do you make it work as well. The second point I want to cover is technical expertise is sometimes required. Um, so this is basically input from industry experts um, to kind of assist the lawyers and obviously the tribunal to understand, you know, how different things work, in, especially in the blockchain, when you have to like trace and track. Um, this is similar to other types of commercial disputes where liability experts are required. Um, sometimes you also need to look at quantification of damages um, and what is required for kind of more difficult and, and complex claims where it might not be as straightforward what the loss is. Um, obviously, market fluctuations um, affect matters a lot. And because of the decentralized nature of crypto, it means that it is generally more complicated um, to establish and quantify the loss at a specific point. And that, that could obviously impact on the measure of damages and the assessment needed. Um, I also wanted to mention the factors, the regulatory concerns um, being one of the factors as well, because as we're all aware, certain jurisdictions have banned or heavily regulate um, crypto assets, such as mainland China, Russia, Qatar, amongst other jurisdictions have banned crypto. This can obviously affect the arbitral um, arbitrariety of the um, crypto disputes and also the enforcement of related awards, which I'll cover later in, the, in this talk as well. Um, so I think all of us is aware of a case in the mainland, um, I think about two years ago now, where they set an aside award on public policy grounds um, because of this reason. The last thing I want to mention was, you know, considering whether interim measures um, would be suitable over crypto assets. So interim measures can be essential in crypto arbitrations, given the potential for crypto assets to be dissipated in seconds. Um, this is obviously looking at preserving assets and claimants must act very quickly on that. Um, although it might be argued that it is easy to trace transactions um, through a publicly available blockchain, there are complex ways of concealing digital assets. And that's again, when you might need to get the expert um, involved to actually kind of go through the layers and, and make sure that you can track fast um, so you can locate the asset and, and recover it um, before it's dissipated. Um, in order to manage the risk at early stage, you know, it is highly recommended um, that you get um, the interim measures, obviously for the lawyers and arbitration practitioners, but also get the experts on board as well. It is very common for courts in Hong Kong, Singapore and the UK for granting kind of like propriety and freezing injunctions. But in terms of arbitration, I think the interim measures is something that we also need to look at, not just for preserving assets, but also preserving evidence um, relevant to the dispute. Um, however, tracing um, of some form may be easier on the blockchain. Um, again, it, it's just something, depending on the case that you're dealing with, to consult and make sure that you know, whatever it is, is there ready. So in the event that you do get the judgment, um, you, you have something um, ready um, to be enforced at that point.
Thank you, Jennifer, for these practical considerations. If we take a more uh, focused jurisdiction approach, I would like to go to Korea and uh, ask Hun Yang, uh, how is the Korean market in terms of cryptocurrency developments? Did the courts handle any cryptocurrency disputes recently? Okay, thank you for addressing that. Um, so in Korea, like any other jurisdictions, there are a number of disputes arising between crypto and platform companies and its users. So um, it is not surprising since South Korea is also one of the largest crypto um, market in the world. Yet Korea is not a crypto friendly country. Um, according to one research, Korea was ranked 51st place in terms of assessing the crypto friendly environment. This is also notable considering that Korea is willing to adopt various regulations into place these days to regulate the new Wild West. Bearing this in mind, there was a recent case in the Korean courts regarding the quantification of damages occurred in crypto investing. The facts were quite simple. Um, one of the user requested its platform. It was actually one of the Korean local platform company to transfer a certain amount of his Bitcoins into another designated account. However, the platform company for, uh, for some reason failed to do so and transfer the Bitcoin to a completely irrelevant account. At that point, which was November, 2018, one Bitcoin amounted to 3,800 US dollars. In September, 2021, uh, when the user brought this claim to the court, one Bitcoin amounted to around 10 times more, which was 40,000 US dollars. The court accepted the user's position that the company breached the contract by transferring the Bitcoin to an irrelevant account and that there was no force majeure which exempted the company from performing its contractual obligations. However, the highlight of this case, of course, was the quantification of damages. Before going into the details, the principle of recovering damage, if I may briefly explain, under the Korean law, when the obligator is in delay of performing its contractual obligations, as in this case, is that the obligator is to pay damages of amount quantified at the time when the factual deliberation at the court comes to an end. The question here was, however, would the court apply the same principle considering that there was a huge fluctuation of the amount of Bitcoin between when the platform company failed to transfer the Bitcoin to the correct account and when the dispute was actually referred to at the Korean courts, as you would recall that the value of that Bitcoin jumped up about 10 times. The court's, the court's ruling was this, the platform company was ordered to recover the damage by the form of Bitcoin. Um, if for some reason it is impossible to do so, the platform company should recover the damage in cash. And as for the time of reverting, which is the highlight, um, is that the company should revert the Bitcoin into cash when the factual deliberation came to an end, meaning that the company was to pay the Bitcoin reverted into the amount of 40,000 US dollars per Bitcoin, not, not 3,800 US dollars per Bitcoin. And this is also in line with the damage quantification principle just mentioned under the Korean law. Apparently the court made no exceptions to it. So um, many issues and questions still remain obviously, uh, like um, Jennifer also um, previously pointed out, when is an appropriate um, timing for the court to quantify the damage in relation to the crypto disputes, given the nature, the unique nature of crypto assets? Uh, what if uh, specifically the crypto fluctuates dramatically? And more interesting enough, what if the crypto fluctuates um, dramatically during the day when it was ordered required to be quantified and reverted into cash to recover the damage? And how can the court enforce its decision against the decentralized platform companies? Um, all of these issues uh, remain outstanding in Korea um, under the Korean law, but I believe it would be the same under many other jurisdictions as well. Thank you, Hun Yang, for this update from Korea. And uh, yes, actually, that's the question uh, to, for today. And I would like to turn to David, uh, who, whose experience covers a variety of jurisdictions, governing law, seat of arbitrations. Uh, David, do you see any uh, differences between jurisdictions on how to handle cryptocurrency disputes, given the regulatory differences to allow or ban uh, cryptocurrency? Thank you very much for that question, Gokje. And let me uh, uh, kind of work my way towards an answer by first 
discussing, uh, describing the crypto market generally. We're currently in a, a crypto winter, as everyone is aware. Prices have fallen rather dramatically. The uh, total global market cap for cryptocurrencies has gone from more than three trillion at its height to about 820 billion US. Bitcoin is still the big brother of them all and was the first. It stands at about 38% of the total market. Uh, and there are some 20,000 altcoins uh, also uh, and various tokens, NFTs in existence as well. So as um, our other speakers have intimated, uh, the courts and the regulators, uh, especially in, in recent years, have been working to get their heads around crypto to better understand it uh, and decide uh, really what it is. Is it animal, vegetable or mineral? Uh, so let me just quickly run through some of the some of the key cases um, here in Hong Kong, 2019, Samara v. Dan, uh, Doreen Le Pichon judge. Um, granted a Mareva injunction over Bitcoin that had been held on an exchange, uh, uh, treating it as though it were a form of property without making an express finding uh, that it is. Uh, in the same year, 2019, in the Coin case, Q-U-O-I-N-E, the Singapore International Commercial Court similarly uh, held that uh, Bitcoin in the hands of the defendant uh, was held on trust. Again, treating it as a form of property. Then here in my own uh, jurisdiction of New Zealand, in 2020, we have the Rusco v. Cryptopia case. Uh, a, again, a case, um, a, an investor uh, uh, challenging a, um, uh, uh, an exchange, a platform uh, in liquidation. Uh, the uh, New Zealand uh, platform had customers from over 230 different countries and several hundred different types of coins and, and tokens, uh, digital, digital assets um, uh, in, its, in its coffers when it went into liquidation. In that case, the court uh, found that the crypto uh, was held on trust uh, and that it was a form of, of intangible uh, digital property. Uh, next, uh, 2022, uh, the CLM versus CLN case in Singapore, uh, an interesting fact pattern where uh, uh, an American on holiday, I think in Mexico, uh, allowed his home safe uh, uh, code to, to leak out and his C words were stolen and his crypto then disappeared. Uh, and in that case, the uh, Singapore High Court held that the stolen Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin and ETH, were uh, a, a species of intangible property. Uh, and again, he imposed a, a global Mareva freezing injunction. Now, uh, as has been mentioned, this is a very fast moving area. Uh, and on 7 November of, of just earlier this month, the US District Court in New Hampshire in the United States uh, granted summary judgment against library uh, that was uh, had issued uh, tokens, uh, LBC uh, tokens, which it argued were uh, uh, were on a blockchain. Uh, it was, it was uh, open code. It was uh, they they went on and on about how it resembled Bitcoin, but um, I think what did them in in that case uh, is that the undisputed facts showed that. Uh, the, the defendant library had reserved some 400 million uh, pre-mine LBC to hold for itself, which it uh, assigned out to venture capital uh, financiers uh, and otherwise uh, used for its own purposes. So the court in uh, SEC v. Library, again, just earlier this month, applied the Howey test, H-O-W-E-Y, uh, which is um, uh, from a U.S. Court, uh, Supreme Court decision of the same name, 1946. So this is gospel to the uh, U.S. regulators. It has a, a four-part test. You need an investment in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits from the efforts of others. That is a promoter or an insider. Uh, and all that was present in SEC v. Library. Uh, Interestingly, library may be the first SEC enforcement action that did not involve 
uh, an ICO, an initial coin offering. Now, also, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, again, things move very quickly. Uh, word uh, the, reached the press, the, the uh, uh, trading platform FTX, uh, operating out of the Bahamas, has blown up. Uh, on the 2nd of November, it leaked out that FTX's principal asset was its own uh, coin, you know, FTT, that was spun up out of, out of thin air, uh, and perhaps the value was uh, increased through uh, wash trading sorts of activities and, and pumped up. And uh, it's been said that the news of the explosion of FTC, the implosion of FTC, uh, caused regulators around the world to be dragged out of their beds in the middle of the night. And I'm, I'm certain that that's true. Uh, one pundit described the FTX uh, affair as a Ponzi scheme sitting on top of a casino. Uh, so the crypto markets are still largely an unregulated sector. You have uh, KYC, know your customer and, and anti-money laundering procedures in place generally uh, at most recognized exchanges. So you, you flash your passport and uh, prove who you are uh, and they have that information. Uh, as was mentioned, only a few countries, uh, Egypt among them, have purported to ban crypto trading entirely. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, El Salvador has uh, adopted uh, BTC as, as legal tender. Now, here in Hong Kong, the regulators have uh, adopted a pragmatic uh, policy, same activity, same risks, same regulation. So uh, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, hey, we'll treat it like a duck. Uh, uh, the Hong Kong regulators, SFC, HKMA, uh, try to protect the, the punters, the, the small investors with professional only uh, restrictions. On 31 October of this year, again, uh, just, just less than a month ago, the SFC announced uh, its approval of exchange traded funds for, uh, for general investors uh, that would be limited to what they're referring to as mainstream cryptos, which I'm presuming would be Bitcoin and Ethereum only, at, at least for a time. So in my view, it's too soon to tell how regulation will impact crypto dispute resolution in different markets. Uh, arbitration being a creature of contract, of course, uh, I uh, had a quick troll through the terms of use of the various major exchanges. Now, the world's largest exchange, Binance, I think it's been mentioned, uh, requires by its terms of use, HKIC uh, dispute resolution. Uh, under the administered arbitration rules then in effect. FTX, uh, uh, Coinbase, uh, which is NASDAQ, NASDAQ listed in the US, require AAA uh, arbitration of disputes. And uh, Kraken uh, requires JAMS uh, arbitration. And uh, Kraken is an interesting case uh, because the state of Wyoming granted Kraken the first ever charter as a special depository institution. So uh, jam uh, jurisdictions around the world that's looking to, to attract uh, all the, uh, the talent and riches that, uh, that this space uh, offers. Uh, so to, to summarize, uh, regulators around the world uh, including uh, the, the chair of IOSCO, the International Association of Securities Commissions, have very recently publicly acknowledged Bitcoin as a digital commodity and not a security. Uh, and while uh, I think Ethereum, uh, uh, with its uh, enormous utility, uh, may be treated the same way, uh, I think it could be argued that the jury is still out on all other coins and tokens. Uh, and just what will happen in terms of uh, contagion and fallout from, uh, from FTX's uh, recent incident, I think, uh, I think that remains to be seen. So I hope I've covered the topic. I think that's where we're at. 
Thank you, David. Yes, you covered the topic and thank you very much for taking us through the both sides of Pacific and then El Salvador and Egypt. It was very informative. Um, on the on, I would like to ask one final question about cryptocurrency and then move on to other parts of technology disputes. Uh, expertise in this area is often underlined and Jennifer also underlined this in her uh, part of the questions. Do you think that uh, a special expertise is necessary for cryptocurrency disputes or in general technology? disputes from your view? Well, again, thank you for the question. Uh, in reverse order, uh, for technology disputes, uh, I think, first of all, uh, you're going to need someone who's legally trained. I think if uh, the reputed uh, inventor of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he or she is, um, were to uh, identify themselves, uh, they would not perform well in the role of, of a commercial arbitrator. So you have a lawyer, and I think you want someone who, in any event, is uh, experienced running uh, complex arbitrations as sole arbitrator or as uh, the presiding arbitrator. So with those two, with those two threshold matters behind us, uh, my answer would be would be yes. Uh, digital assets, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's evolving very, very fast. It takes a lot of time to really get your head around it. Uh, and if, if you've got the type of arbitrator who um, runs off to the genius bar at, at Apple when they have the slightest technical issue uh, and, and just is not comfortable uh, with, with technical matters generally, uh, I think they're going to be at a disadvantage. Uh, it's also true that many uh, so-called tech disputes uh, primarily concern the construction of commercial contracts. So there's there's not necessarily a lot of technical magic to many of these cases. Uh, but on the other hand, some cases do. And uh, as an example, uh, not too long ago, uh, I was sole arbitrator on, on a dispute between two telecom companies, large telecom companies. Uh, and, and the dispute revolved around an interconnection agreement. And having been in, uh, with the two largest telcos for 15 years myself, having negotiated this type of contract between commercial parties as, as one of a, a substantial team, I, I should add, uh, they're, they're heavily negotiated agreements and they're very particular to the telco industry. But having that background, uh, I was confident and I was comfortable uh, with, with what uh, the parties were arguing, what they showed me, and I was also comfortable that I had reached the right decision in the case. So um, uh, that's just one, one uh, instance. But whether we're talking about IP licensing, research and development agreements, collaboration agreements, whatever, uh, where there's a, a heavy tech component, I think at, at the very minimum, once you have a lawyer with strong case management skills, they have to have a curiosity and an interest and an ability to pick up uh, tech uh, issues quickly and understand them. Otherwise, you're going to waste time and money and you may end up reaching uh, not, not the uh, optimal uh, decision. So uh, that's my view, both as to tech cases generally, and I think uh, uh, it's definitely the case in, uh, in crypto matters. Thank you very much, David. One of the um, niche areas when we talk about technology disputes is actually cybersecurity, and we don't talk about this uh, area enough. And since we have an expert from a cybersecurity company, uh, I wanted to uh, ask Bernard, uh, uh, Bernard, do you think that arbitration is suitable for uh, disputes arising out of breach of cybersecurity? As you also know, many jurisdictions handle these type of disputes through their courts or even prosecutors. I was uh, curious about your opinion as to their suitability in arbitration. All right, great. Thank you, Conker. Um, so obviously our arbitration offers us the ability to enforce in many jurisdictions that's a plus. Uh, New York Convention countries, confidentiality of proceedings and certainty of outcome. So that's 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 definitely a great thing. Um, but then if you look at cybersecurity as a whole, who are the players, right? I mean, the first one would be the regulators, right? Because they are the ones often that, that you know, the SEC and, um, and the uh, supervising authority and the GDPR and, and stuff like that, you know, they are the ones that are going after 
right? Uh, the the entity. So regulators tend to want to investigate uh, into incidents, and they have a public duty, right? Almost almost a public interest duty to share their learnings of the incident and motivate other businesses, right, to improve the cybersecurity measures. So the likelihood of them agreeing to arbitrate, right, is not very high. <laughs> okay, let's just put it this way. Um, and then um, look at it also the other way around, right? I mean, if you are not the one, right, you're, you're not the poster child, oh, okay, of a cybersecurity breach. So if you want to tell your board to spend $1 million US dollars on the cybersecurity project, that would typically be hard in this kind of environment. But then if you, you know, announce, right, take out the news and say, look, you know, one of our peer companies had to pay 5% of their previous year's turnover. And the general manager personally was fined up to 140,000 US dollars. And this is all, by the way, all over social media, right? Um, then it becomes a much easier conversation to get your one million. In fact, you can ask for two million, right, for your cybersecurity project. So there, there are there are kind of pros and cons as why. Um, of course, if you are obliged to tell your customers and users of the incident, then again, the the, the, the benefit of confidentiality is gone, right, of uh, arbitration. And then lastly, um, I would say that there is not exactly that arbitration is totally useless, right? I mean. Um, I think arbitration have one thing good for it, and that is the ability to enforce um, against you know assets, especially or, or companies uh, abroad, easily. Right? Uh, court judgments don't travel that well, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that there are situations whereby um, the customer is so big and so secretive about it that they don't really want this incident to go public. So there are cases where um, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't, uh, they will still want to have an arbitration, right, rather than a, um, a court case. Uh, just just one little uh, note that there's another concern that cybersecurity of the arbitration proceedings are now also uh, taken into consideration. So various parties are adopting a protocol to promote cybersecurity and in international arbitration, right, um, to, 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 you know, to bring awareness of that um, as well. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. That, that's the last part is definitely a discussion topic for another series of this yep. dispute uh, yep. series. Uh, I want to um, turn to um, the software services industry. I remember that you also have specialized in that area. Uh, as many business uh, providers enter into software license contracts with a technology service provider for their businesses, uh, let's cover this, this this type of disputes as well. Um, Bernard, uh, do you use arbitration clauses uh, for development of software contracts? Uh, for example, Hong Kong is a good uh, seat of arbitration for IP disputes, considering that they're arbitrable here. Uh, is there any other uh, advantage of choosing Hong Kong in your opinion, or are there any other jurisdictions that you use as a seat of arbitration in your contracts? Uh, certainly. So obviously Hong Kong is, um, is I think still very much trusted, right? It's the seat of arbitration. Um, and typically Hong Kong is kind of the gateway to China, right? Uh, so uh, Hong Kong arbitration will facilitate enforcement of IP rights in mainland China. And that's a try and tested way of doing business. Uh, especially recently there, there was a uh, supplemental arrangement concerning mutual uh, enforcement of arbitral awards, I think in uh, 27th of November, 2020, that's a new one. Uh, so now it makes it even easier because now you can have what I call simultaneous applications in both mainland China and Hong Kong. So you don't have to choose one or the other, right? You can do both, right? You cannot, um, you cannot recover more, right? Than your total amount of your claim, but you can, you know, you can go with both. So, um, so is there problems? Um, the, and I, I would say so, so, so generally that's good, right? But, um, so the, the, the main benefit of actually arbitration in Hong Kong is not really so much uh, uh, about, you know, um, uh, software development, the one that you just mentioned, because we typically for IP rights, we, we want to go to court, right? To be able to exert it and then set a precedent, right? Typically that's what you want. Uh, the, the real benefit of arbitration, right? Uh, is really where you don't want people to know about it, right? 
And that typically happens when you have, say, uh, a joint venture to develop something new, right? A new product, a new technology, uh, and you don't really want your the details of a collaboration to be shared, you know, in, a, in the press, especially if they have, say, VIE structure, if you know what I mean, variable interest entity structures and stuff like that. You do, don't really want to wash your dirty linen uh, across the social media. So, um, so that's great. Uh, and then the other thing is um, uh, interim measures are now uh, available, as you know, under that, that um, um, uh, measure that they have is now available for throughout the entire lifespan of the um, uh, arbitration in Hong Kong. So in the past, interim measures were not, uh, were not available post award. Um, and then last point to David's point about uh, knowing, you know, um, technology, right? Uh, I'll just cite a personal experience, right? So, you, you know, China, for instance, have uh, pushed for IP courts. You might have heard of that, right? They, they have come up with IP courts. So a lot of people say, well, yeah, we have IP courts. You know, they are the specialists and they'll see all these cases. So I have been um, fortunate or unfortunate enough to appear as an expert witness in one of these IP court cases, okay? Uh, so so I had to explain what cloud technology is about and how cloud solutions are being implemented, right? And suffice to say that I was still, I was a little bit surprised that some of these issues are still kind of viable uh, to most people we would like, but of course, you know? Yeah, so uh, I'll just say that uh, generally they're not that mature. So you still have to go through a lot of explanation. Um, as to your last question about uh, which other other you know forums uh, you would choose is definitely the one that a lot of people consider is the Singapore um, uh, SIAC is definitely a public choice for technology um, arbitration. Thank you, Bernard. Um, and Hun Yang, I remember when I was reading your CV, you also have experience with software license disputes. And I was wondering whether there are any particulars or any update from Hong, uh, Korea, especially in terms of interpretation of contracts. Do you have any practical tips for the users or the parties to bear in mind uh, when interpreting co contracts? And is there any chance for the Adhesion Contract Act to apply in interpreting the software license contracts under the Korea Law. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so one of the software disputes I was involved in in the past dealt with exact question. The purpose of Audition Contract Act, I'm sure, would be similar to other jurisdictions as well, is to protect the customers uh, as opposed to business parties when entering into a standardized terms and conditions. In other words, the, this law was designed to protect the customers from the possible inequality that may arise from the difference in the party's negotiation power. One of the main legal issues that came up during this course of the dispute between a software and license service provider company and the user company was whether the Adhesion Contract Act could apply to the license agreement that was entered into between these two parties. This was also a core issue in the jurisdictional phase as the user company wished to continue the dispute in the local courts of Korea instead of arbitration, and therefore wished to argue that the arbitration agreement, uh, which was included in the license agreement, was not valid. The user company relied on a number of arguments, including that under the Adhesion Contract Act. In, in this case, particularly if the act was applied, the user company had a chance to argue that the arbitration clause was not valid as the software service provider company did not explain the terms of the arbitration clause to the user as required under the act. However, before going into the details of the arbitration clause, there was one big hurdle for the, um, the user company to overcome under the Adhesion Contract Act. Does it apply to contracts that were entered into between two business parties as the user company was also a corporation, not an individual? Does this mean that the user company was not a customer under the Adhesion Contract Act? Here, um, the Korean District Court uh, shed light on this issue. The court applied this act uh, to contracts that were entered into between two business parties. And this case explicitly provided that the term customer also includes corporation, if that party were offered uh, the terms and conditions from the counterparty. 
This, I believe, has some important implications for many companies to consider. The software license companies especially should consider in mind that their license agreements may be subject to adhesion contract act if the contract is governed under the Korean law. Um, in most cases, the user company as a customer and the software provider company go through an extensive negotiation um, to finalize the terms and conditions in relation to licenses, the details of the licenses, for example, the scope, the type, the number, and etc. But the parties easily may disregard other important terms, such as arbitration agreement, as in this case, when entering into the contract. If there is no evidence to prove that there was a substantive negotiation on these terms, these terms may not be considered valid if, the, if this act applies. So depending on which position you're in, uh, this may cause some um, unexpected difficulty in handling, your, in handling your dispute. Thank you very much, Yun Yang. Uh, this is very interesting and uh, I... Although I have a, a follow-up question, first I will uh, continue with the um, with the uh, questions that we have. And uh, before I do that, before even I do that, I would like to remind all of our attendees to use the Q&A function to submit their questions. We received some, and I will ask those uh, questions in the end of our discussion. So Jennifer, I would like to pose my last question to you. Um, do you think that the anonymous arbitration systems, uh, for example, their on-chain arbitration uh, called Claros, and we also see other arbitration systems used in digital assets uh, would be useful for resolving disputes arising out of uh, digital assets. And do you think that there are any concerns uh, regarding these disputes and this autonomous systems in light of the New York Convention? Great, thank you. So in terms of on-chain arbitration, it is certainly useful to resolving certain types of disputes. And I see that the use is really in kind of simple commercial and kind of consumer disputes where, you know, the resolutions are capable of being programmed and there are set triggers. Um, however, I think in terms of kind of more like complex um, and less straightforward disputes, you probably wouldn't want what, uh, you know, I would probably refer to this as fast justice. And I think some may prefer, you know, to resolve disputes using the more traditional methods because of the limitations to on-chain arbitrations. I think we previously discussed this at the second event um, for this tech dispute series as well um, with the experts, um, you know, and where we kind of covered there is, you know, there is potentially a need for off-chain solutions tailored to, you know, digital assets and kind of crypto related disputes because of, you know, kind of the specialties that I've, pre I've previously mentioned, but also what David has covered as well earlier on and providing that kind of escalation um, method for parties um, to resolve their disputes before a tribunal who can determine the evidence before them. The, the other issues that I want to cover is really identifying the correct counterparty. And I think David has previously mentioned this as well in an anonymous arbitration setting. This can actually be quite difficult. Obviously, take a note of the platform's kind of terms and conditions to identify the correct counterparty. But, you know, there may be, again, a need to kind of instruct experts to find out who those counterparties are and who the claimant should be claiming against. Um, because if you don't get it right, then, you know, how, how do you enforce when, when things go wrong, especially with, you know, not knowing the true identity? Turning to obviously concerns when considering um, the New York Convention and enforcement, I wanted to leave the audience with some food for thought, really. You know, certain issues such as which jurisdiction and, you know, is the counterparty or the contracting party in one of those contracting jurisdictions? And when we look at obviously grounds to refuse enforcement as well, there's already the public policy grounds. So in light of the changing kind of regulatory landscape, it is always good to check, you know, is crypto actually lawful in that country, you know, where you're seeking to enforce? Does a party have capacity? And how do you know if the party is anonymous? Um, how about proper notice being given in the proceedings? Would you deal with kind of non-participation of party in the same way as well? Um, and then lastly, you know, we all know that obviously the court consider refusing enforcement if it's just to do so. And I think in crypto related claims, there may need to be some creativeness to be thought of um, when we're thinking of reasons there. Thank you, gotcha.
Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I yes, uh, that's that's very good, and especially considering the expertise point, um, this kind of autonomous systems are going to be. Uh, discussed a lot, I guess, in the future as well. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone. This has been an informative discussion as to technology disputes. And I would like to now turn to our Q&A session. Um, for our attendees, please feel free to submit any questions you may have. And I also would like to thank Association of Corporate Council for supporting this event. And uh, now I will ask uh, one question to David and Jennifer. Uh, what is the best source of information for arbitration practitioners to learn about digital asset technology? Is there a book, a blog, a podcast, or do you have, uh, or is hands-on experience a good e experience? And uh, Jennifer, shall we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it really depends on, you know, which stage you're at and kind of what you want to know as well. Um, there's a lot of good books in terms of if you want to learn about blockchain technology, so more of the kind of beginning um, type of Intel or, you know, what Bernard was saying in terms of cloud technology, if that's, you know, kind of what you're looking at there as well. Um, obviously, that there, there are also podcasts um, and, you know, even our Hong Kong 45 tech dispute series has, has been recorded. So if you want to find out more about, you know, crypto and kind of how um, the impacts of it in Hong Kong and Asia Pacific, then, you know, th these are good things to kind of review again. Um, but in terms of obviously running a case and stuff, nothing would be on hands on experience in, in my view. David, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, I, I certainly agree with all that, Jennifer. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that the problem is that we drown in, in resources and information on this topic. There's just so much of it all around. But one, um, one book that I am comfortable recommending, and I've, I've uh, footnoted to it in, in uh, awards, is called uh, Mastering Bitcoin, Programming the Open Blockchain. Uh, it's in its second edition by Andreas M. Antonopoulos. And, uh, uh, crypto people, Bitcoiners will recognize that name. Uh, you'll see him in social media all the time. The book is a, a Creative Commons 4.0 book, meaning uh, give him attribution if you cite it, but otherwise you can swap it around and use it freely as, as I do. It's more than 400 pages and it can be extremely technical and dense. But if you really want to start at the beginning with basic principles, and, and then move forward quickly, I recommend it. I think I paid about 10 US dollars for the book, by the way. Um, thank you very much, David. I will. I also took a note of the book. Uh, it's it's very useful. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, actually, it's re relevant to the previous one. It says, putting aside the dispute resolution choice and the asset class crypto, the trend we see is that digital first and high tech companies nowadays operate on new communications platforms and collaborate in novel ways. These new platforms do not necessarily make evidence preservation review in support of investigations as easy as it was before. In turn, does this force lawyers at all levels to get up to speed quickly? How would they do that? Um, well, this is an open question to everyone, uh, and I, I would like to hear your views. Maybe I'll go first. Um, again, as, as a former general counsel in, in uh, telecoms for 15 years, uh, I found that a lot of my more sensitive communications to the CEO or board members were by text rather than by email. And this was a number of years ago. Uh, I, I think the observation is correct. And, and I think it just highlights that very early in the case, perhaps at the time of the, uh, uh, the pre-hearing, you know, the, the uh, case management conference preliminary hearing, uh, some of these issues ought to be vetted. You need to, you need to find out uh, how communication is done and, and what information is there. Otherwise, how can you give the tribunal any reliable sort of impression as to what um, disclosure, what discovery is going to be needed in your case? Thank you, David. Is there any other views, Jennifer? 
Yeah, I certainly agree. Um, and I think, it, you know, discovery seems to be getting a lot wider nowadays, um, especially with all the platforms. Um, but a lot of the data might not be, you know, immediately available or might not be immediately retrievable as well. So that might be something to consider as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I would add from an in-house perspective, right, that if there is a um, dispute brewing, right, typically um, you have to turn on that kind of a uh, mode that this is going to go potentially into disputes. So you have to have a, um, a set of um, lit litigation or, or dispute resolution procedure, right? Where you obviously you keep your, your um, you ask them to keep your, uh, the data emails and stuff like that and start laying the paper trail. Because without, without having this paper trail in one place, the effort to litigate or the effort to then produce documents for arbitration and stuff like that is going to be tremendous. So um, yeah, so so the idea is that make sure that you have a proper protocol when something is about to go wrong. Put in one place, have a single channel of communication, right? That will make life a lot easier for you later on. I, if I can add to that, uh, and I, I totally agree with Bernard's comment, uh, not only do you need to uh, to have a uh, an asset free sort of protocol that uh, nothing is destroyed that could be a potential relevance to the dispute, but the the uh, flip side of that is also true. Uh, part of the uh, data management, document management procedures of the company must include getting rid of uh, materials that are older than a, a certain number of years, so that it just doesn't accumulate along with. Uh, somebody's dog and cat photos on, on a PC somewhere only to be discovered later on. Uh, but again, uh, God bless the general counsel who's got budget and time for all this. And, and very often these are just aspirational goals. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this is this is all from us. Thank you very much to our speakers and our supporting organization ACC and for organization Jade Lamb uh, and HK45. It's been a pleasure to discuss uh, technology disputes uh, with you. And thank you very much to all attendees for tuning in and listening to us. Uh, thank you.